Uh, let's go ahead and get started. And so welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Matthew Perrin. I teach in the Religious Studies Department. Uh, my partner in crime here is, uh, well, I'll let him introduce himself, uh, John, uh, in, from the Anthropology Department. But we're going to um, actually, so I was just going to say, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming to this session. And thanks, uh, I think I'll speak for both of us real quick in um, thanking Rachana Sashdev and the rest of the members of the MLK Teach-In uh, Planning Committee for putting this together. It's been an awesome day. Uh, it's really, there's been some great content. So thanks very much. Uh, John, you want to take it away? Sure. Thanks to Dr. DePerrin for stealing my first paragraph that was full of thanks to all kinds of people. I'll get you for that later. Um, so I just, I come from a discipline that usually reads at presentation. So I'm going to be going back and forth between a text and this set of slides. Um, what I want to do today, when I was first asked to participate in this, I felt I had a pretty good handle on what I wanted to talk about, the role of photography in creating, framing, and perpetuating a cultural other um, as an object to be gazed at and as a tool to confirm hierarchies. Um, as I started pulling my notes together, I realized I'd have to work hard to not pursue too many threads at once. The subject is rich and the examples are many. I'll try to exercise a deft avoidance of rabbit holes. Anybody who's in this room, who's in any of my classes know my, knows my weakness for rabbit holes. Um, the history of photography, for example, or that of world's fairs and expositions, or the formative connections between the history of physical anthropology and photographic systems of criminal typologies. Not to drift and not to speak so long that I cut into time for our discussion. For today, I really want to kind of tie four elements together to provide some sort of context for my main subject, which is how photographic representation has been a powerful technology for both depicting and creating an other. And my, my air quotes are going to get tired uh, halfway through this. So if they, you see them in splints, that's why. Um, the other is a category of difference to be held at a distance, a confirmation either of civilization or its lack. And to be assured, I use civilization here, again, air quotes, as a point of critique, not a state to be assumed or naturalized. And also, as Professor DePerrin will, will engage, I wish to establish that images are not a neutral medium. They say more about the spectators than what we might call the spectated. So I've got four places I want to go. The first is about photographic technology and its history and practice. The second is about anthropometry. The third is about world's fairs and expositions. And the fourth is about um, W.E.D. Du Bois's um, exhibition of photographs at the 1900 Paris, Paris exhibition. So I want to start with, hang on, uh-oh, yes. Um, this happy gentleman, this is William Henry Fox Talbot, who invented uh, the negative photographic process in 1835. It wasn't perfected until the 1850s. Some people think that the daguerreotype was the first photograph, but what Talbot's process did was create a glass plate wet collodion that formed a negative, which meant that you could take that image and you could repeat it in terms of printing, right? Then you could use it for catalog, you could use it for all kinds of stuff. Um, the existence of a negative depositive process also meant that you could create these images indefinitely. Photography shared a lot of the mid 19th century's optimism and perspective on the processes of mechanical representation, right? So we're talking mid 19th century, we're talking an emphasis on industrialization, we're talking a fascination with machines. Um, what Talbot called the pencil of nature described an intersection of technology and the natural world, a sort of transparent denotative transference from the visible world to the photographic record from nature to culture without connotative interpretive influence. That photographs served as direct transfers, what Susan Sontag would later call something stenciled off the reel, like a footprint or a death mask. Photographs have a really problematic re um, relationship with the visible world though. At once, both record and object, photographs are created by the registration of light on a photosensitive subject, reflected light. And this is just a very um, down and dirty sketch of a, uh, how a, a camera works, a field camera. This would be sort of the, the apparatus that Talbot would might be most familiar with, the bellows, the front lens, a plate in the background on which to focus that you would then replace with something photosensitive. So photographs don't capture subjects. What photographs capture is the light that subjects emanate. 
As instruments recording and representing such indexical reflection, photographs have been popularly misunderstood as indexically representing reality. The photographic document has become an evidential measure of authenticity, and this crossover between what photographs show and what is real or what serves as evidence is kind of important here. The birth of photojournalism, right, which tied this, this image making process to um, things in the world, really um, is, is often connected to the Civil War. Um, that, that photographs of the Civil War battlefields were the first representations, mechanical representations and reproductions of things that happened in the world. And they served as evidence of what was going on in the battlefields. Um, they became, they fed a certain growing public conviction that photographs were fully transparent vehicles for the really real. They served as evidence and they gradually replaced the more easily recognizable as interpretive drawings and sketches that had previously been used to illustrate newspapers or newspaper accounts, right? What this evidential assumption obscured was the positionality of photographs, what stories they were used to illustrate and how they served to create or frame subjects. They're not fully neutral. They're not fully transparent. They, they do something, they have agency. Um, as a photo technology that captures reflected light and arrests it on a light sensitive surface, surface photography was seen as a transparent mean to represent the, me the to represent the real. Again, we'll go back to this. What's important to consider here is not just what photos represent, but how they represent. Um, as visual documents that record the appearance of the individual body, um, photographs have become enormously useful in registering that body. The photograph is a representation with the power of evidence. The photograph not only pays homage to a subject, but it's also a powerful means of asserting control over it. This initial image here, um, anthropometry was, a, was an element or a tool of er early physical anthropology that used a, a system of measurement to try to categorize or create topologies of difference between different kinds of people connected to, to photography as an evidential technology. Um, where uh, images of different people would be used as ways to support typologies of racialized difference. Um, so anthropometry, a system of measuring and identification, an early tool of physical anthropology, later used as a means of correlation between physical attributes and variation with racial and psychological traits, both hallmarks of, of race science, what would, would later or in that moment be developed as race science and eugenics rely on this visual record of measurement of its subjects to be realized as evidence. What I want to point out here is that appearance has long been critical to cultural perception, both in the popular imaginary, as well as in the more rarefied circles of such methodologies of anthropology and photography, as we see here. Cameras accompanied colonial projects and extensions of empire from the unfolding of manifold destiny of manifest destiny to subjects brought underneath a variety of colonial yokes. And these are Andaman Islanders that are part of a, creating a photographic record and documenting scientific difference between different kinds of, of body types and typologies. As evidence photographs were used to depict the difference, the distance different subjects had from civilization. As such, they would benefit from the gifts of colonial rule and administration. Photographs could be used to both picture savages and primitives in far off, uh, far off lands, again, my air quotes have become tired, and to bolster programs of civilization, the transformation of wild Indians, if you will, into functioning citizens of the US nation state, for example. These are before and after photographs of, of Indian children um, being subjects of Indian boarding schools, the Indian boarding school um, project in the United States. And they were used as, um, as slides to, to pursue funding you would see, look, we can take these savage people and we can render them as, as civilized people. And this is what our project is. And the photograph served as a way to, to cement that argument. Civilization here is connected to the discourses of progress and technology. And that these discourses I'm, I'm arguing here are probably best amplified in world's fairs and expositions. Um, World's Fairs and Expositions sort of subtitle to this is Come and See the Not Us, that, the, that the, those that are not us are subjects for our visual consumption. This is a Crystal Palace, uh, the World's Fair in, um, in London. 
This is the interior where you can see that you've got, you know, over on the left-hand side where these women are standing, you've got some examples of, of contemporary technology, new, new advances in, in carriages or in motor vehicles. And you've also got this kind of connection to um, indigenous lifeways, um, this canoe hanging from the ceiling as part of the Canada kind of part of, of the exposition. Um, this is the, a, a map from the, um, from the Paris Exposition in 1900. Um, and you can see here, it's, it's hard to read, I, I, I admit, but the different colors here are showing different colonial and different national kind of pavilions where um, people come and bring their technologies or are made the subject of certain kinds of curiosities, right? So French national fairs are kind of just really quick contextual history. National fairs lead to the Industrial Exposition in 1844. The Crystal Palace that we just saw in it was in 1851. The Emancipation Proclamation in the United States, 1862. The rise of eugenics um, through both Francis Galton and others in 1869. Um, the linking of cultural evolution as a theory that explains, um, sort of gets linked to a, um, a projection of civilization or, or a projection of, of advancement, if you will, um, through both Charles Darwin and Lewis Henry Morgan in the 1870s. Um, Alphonse Bertillon takes um, photographs and uses them to invent mug shots, that these photographic records are a way to understand criminality um, and to depict criminality. And that scientific racism really uh, connected to some of the methodologies of physical anthropology and typologies uh, becomes more popular in the late 1800s and 1900s. So all during this time, photography is being increasingly used as an anthropological tool, which brings us to the Paris Exposition in 1900. Part of what goes on in, in thinking about Paris, um, expositions is, sorry, is how they're also used to frame or support these ideas of typologies and hierarchies. The St. Louis Fair, uh, World's Fair catalog on the left here, you can see a sort of um, a descending um, kind of representation of what we might think of as civilization. Up in the very uppermost right hand corner is some white dude who looks very, you know, on top of things with this lovely collar and suit and stuff. And by the time you move around the edges and you get down toward the bottom, you're dealing with people of color, right? That these are at the bottom of this hierarchy this representation of progress or technology uh, it's with the lit torch and you've got this kind of dusky primitive native cowering in the corner with an animal that, or a totem that's supposed to be brought into civilization. So there's that part of it. Then there's the other part where the World's Fairs have these kind of tableau vivants, these, these sort of um, created villages that they people with others so that people going to the Chicago's World Fair, for example, could see real Samoans in real Samoan huts, right? This, this cements an idea of difference, but it also affirms an idea of colonial control, right? These are objects that we can consume just like we can consume our popcorn or other stuff that we're looking at, our souvenirs. Um, and, and this created a, a particular kind of question, right? That really um, uh, Frederick Douglass first looked at or, or wrote a pamphlet about saying why the colored American is not part of the world's Columbian exposition. This is the Chicago exposition. And what he's looking at there is he's saying, look, this is post-emancipation. Black Americans have contributed to the nation in powerful ways. And yet we are not the part of any sort of depiction in these world's fairs, neither in these tableau vivant kind of things, nor as in a recognition of, of contributing to US civilization progress and technologies, right? It's not, we don't show our own emancipated slaves, they're still seen as repulsive kind of savages, right? This is where Du Bois comes in, okay? And, and we know, I mean, I'm sure that many of us know in this room that Du Bois has contributed very fundamentally to imagining both sociology as, as a practice, but also um, into imagining and understanding the functions of race and what race does, right? And he writes in 1897 that the wonderful developments of human history teach that the grosser physical differences of color, hair, and bone go but a short way toward explaining the different roles which groups of men have played in human progress. Yet there are differences, 
subtle, delicate, and elusive, though they may be, which have silently but definitely separated men into groups. So he's speaking to these typologies. He's speaking to these racial categories. And this, in 1897, is definitely informing part of what he's going to do in the 1900 Paris Exposition, right? He says the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. The question of how far differences of race will hereafter be made the basis of denying to over half the world the right of sharing to their utmost ability the opportunities and privileges of modern civilization. What he does then is he engages with the Paris exhibition or uh, exposition, right? And we can see some of the sort of what we might imagine as images from the exposition. Over on the left, this is the cover to the, the sort of catalog for the exposition. Again, kind of like what was going on for St. Louis, you've got this raised figure of this white woman um, who's holding out you know, olive branches, but also is dominating the, the scene. And then descending from her down toward the steps, you start to move into people of color, right? That are also colonial subjects, okay? And the image on the left, or on the right rather, is again sort of an affirmation of this colonial distance that's being affirmed in this kind of um, exposition. What Du Bois set out to do was he created a, um, a series of 500 photographs to be shown at the exhibition, or at the exposition rather, as an album of um, Black American middle class lives, right? to speak back to some of these sort of suppositions about either primitivity or absence and to fold them because he says, you know, he's a, he's a social philosopher and a sociologist to fold them into a set of sociological information and data. Um, I've veered completely off of my script here and it ended up someplace else. So I'm going to return back to it just really briefly because I want to stay on this. Um, we've talked about Frederick Doubl Douglass a little bit. Part of what I wanted to point out for the, you know, to go back to the Samoans is to think about that human beings that are featured in the fair like the Samoans were, were given a place, even if that was a place of exotic difference, and that Black Americans were not so confirmed. In fact, they were conspicuous in their absence, wiped from triumphal stories of American progress and national identity. If indigenous peoples of the world were romanticized as primitive others through their official exhibits, at least they were recognized as existing. For black Americans, near invisibility was a clear statement of their ambiguous position in American culture. Um, so part of what then Du Bois is dealing with here, right? So he's known for a couple of, of key concepts, perhaps none more challenging or even radical than a reconsideration of the main tenets of race sciences what we've talked about and the differences of hair, skin, and bone. Um, this is really the context that we need to approach what's going on in the Paris Exposition. A reconfiguration of how photography is used to help rationalize and make firm, uh, firm differences between races. The photographs from the Paris Exposition illustrate Black Americans as members of an aspiring middle class, not fundamentally different, but fundamentally similar. I'm not a Du Boisian scholar by any stretch of the imagination. What little I do know, however, recognizes his profound insights into race and his understanding of the power of images to frame and support narratives of difference. This is where a good deal of my scholarship also lies. The photos that Du Bois brought to Paris weren't primarily on display for visitors of color. Although they were affirming in that regard, they were primarily on display for the majority white European audiences at the heart of the colonial project. And the narrative they were set to support was one of normalcy, right? Um, they weren't, the photographs aren't connected to an anti-racist polemic, but presented with sociological data like this, and I will leave my sociological colleagues to explain this far more clearly than I can if they're so inspired. This data explores changes to black family incomes and opportunities following emancipation. They perf this performs a certain project in anti-racism and anti-colonialism, even if, as they're displayed in a theater of colonial power and national affirmation. But the photographs here are part of what I want to think about more carefully. Part of what makes them so powerful is their quiet similarity to the sort of bourgeois parlor and studio portraits that white others had assumed as an element of late 19th century modernity. Shown here close to the pavilion celebrating colonies and progress, the images unsettle much of the taken for granted ideas about people of color as primitive, not us, colonial subjects. 
Du Bois's genius was to repurpose the colonial apparatus of both the World's Fair and the camera and to turn these apparatuses back on themselves. What he did was to effectively harness the evidential properties of photographs to present a differently positioned narrative of racial difference and human similarity, one that spoke back to projections of a race-informed hierarchy through visual representation. Um, so Du Bois did not take these photographs, but assembled these photographs from a variety of different sort of um, subject positions to further illustrate that the black middle class was a real thing, that this was something that was normal and should be assumed as part of the American nation state and part of American national identity. I guess, you know, at the end of this really, part of my question would be what, what should we take away from this? Um, and I think it's that we need to think critically and carefully about the taken for granted aspects of, of images to consider what narratives they're supporting and illustrating, what sort of air, um, what, and what sort of identities they may be restricting or refusing to recognize. And that we need to take this caution into our everyday lives, um, our everyday interaction with photos and other images. What does our non-critical consumption of them make possible? And what does it limit? <clears throat> I love the Sisters of the Holy Family. I'm just gonna close on this image. I, I will close with this. Audre Lorde famously suggested that we cannot use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. And in this case, however, I suggest that what Du Bois is doing is using a master's tool, photography, to significantly unsettle that house's foundations, to use the colonial theater of world's fairs and expositions to question the colonial typologies that are informed and perpetuated in the ways that others are allowed to speak or are relegated to silence. And on that, I'll close. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks very much, John. So um, I will start this, uh, the, the second portion here, and then hopefully we will have enough time uh, to end and still and have some discussion and Q&A and everything. Um, so to pick up where uh, John left off, I want to say that so like my remarks here have to do with um, ways that visual, this is sort of moving beyond just the 1800s into now the 1900s and especially uh, film and television and how a particular kind of representation of especially um, Asian religious traditions comes to be dominated by certain uh, tropes and certain uh, assumptions and like sort of how this works and what are the what are the um, consequences of this. So to do this to explore this, um, let me do screen two and then we'll share sound. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about. Can you all see this? So like uh, this term virtual Orientalism, which is uh, a, co a term coined by the scholar Jane Iwamura who is, uh, she's the department head of the um, religious studies department at the University of the West in California. Um, in her tw 2011 book of the same name called Virtual Orientalism. And basically what Iwamura is doing is she is exploring ways that uh, Asian religiosity, especially Buddhism, but she's also talking about Hinduism and you know Shinto and other kind of uh, native Asian uh, religious traditions are represented, especially in film and in television, and what that means for how uh, Westerners uh, will receive those and, and conceive of the other, uh, right? So basically when she, this, this term virtual Orientalism is, it's this kind of, uh, she's, it's a combination of basically two streams of thought. So the first is uh, the Orientalism itself, which is a term that was coined by the late Palestinian American scholar, Edward Said. And uh, Said's idea of Orientalism, it's, it's basically like or Orientalism is all of the concepts and cultural practices behind the idea of this supposed East-West divide, right? So the fact that there is the East and the West. And Said goes into a lot more um, detail about how like his main area of research was about how this supports uh, colonialism and the colonial enterprises of European and American powers. And it, what's significant about this, uh, about this divide, is that the West, so-called, 
um, mostly does refer to a set of cultures and political realities that were historically related and at least somewhat contiguous. So mostly like what we're thinking of, what we now think of as like Western Europe and the North American colonies. So like, you know, basically the US and Canada. Um, the East, however, and I also will get really, you'll get tired. Of this. There's lots of scare quotes. Um, the East mostly just operates almost as like a foil for the West. So it's defined in distinction to the West with not a lot of differentiation between all of the like various things that are included in the East, right? Uh, so it includes basically everything from, you know, East of Turkey. So everything from the Middle East to South Asia, East Asia, everything. Uh, that's all of the East and it gets sort of lumped together in, in its own uh, category. And Saeed points out how the effect of this is that it basically authorizes and legitimates the colonial attitudes of Europeans and North Americans throughout the modern period. And this is what we saw um, in Dr. Bodinger's talk about like the World's Fair expositions. There was this performance of, uh, you know, colonial uh, intra like sort of overlordship that the West was seen as, you know, there's, there's various ways that this is enacted, but the West is seen as uh, you know, rational, scientific, dynamic, progressive, uh, strong, uh, successful, while the East is defined largely in kind of contradistinction to that as superstitious, kind of culturally stagnant, backward, mystical, weak, uh, and like generally in need of Western leadership and development. Uh, John, do you wanna say something? Sorry, just a really quick question. Do you mean to be sharing your your OneNotes no. on the screen? Okay. No, sorry. Ha. Okay. Uh, let me do this again. New share. Uh, so it should be screen two instead of screen one. So let me see if it's screen one. There we go. It had my. I have two monitors and it has them backwards. So now you're seeing virtual orientalism and and the picture of Saeed, right? Yes. Okay. Let's let's go with that. That we actually are seeing it. Um, okay. So that's the so that's the Orientalism piece. Um, so one of the things that we should note, though, that's that's going to be significant for us is that um, even though the Orientalist depiction of the East is not ex like it's not exactly wholly negative, right? So there's some things that are positive about it, um, especially in terms of religion. E what gets termed Eastern religion uh, is like. So it's seen as like deeply peaceful and like calm and insightful and tapping into this like deep well of mystical power. But it's in that very depiction that it's sort of set at a disadvantage against the, you know, rational, powerful, progressive, Western, you know, responsible grown up religion. Uh, so, and that's really significant. So the Orientalism piece is all of the different ways that this, this boundary is maintained and policed and enforced um, in various cultural products. So the second piece of this is pairing you know, Orientalism with the concept of hyper-reality. Uh, and so hyper-reality is a term that's coined by the French cultural theorist uh, Jean Baudrillard. And basically hyper-reality is what happens, it's the sort of merging of reality and a, like a simulation or a depiction of reality. So hyper-reality is what happens when you see the depiction or the simulation so many times that you start to understand, like you, you start to like understand that the simulation is reality itself, that they, like the line is blurred. So the hyper-reality is the sort of depiction of reality and it's unclear where the, this ends and the actual reality begins. Um, so now Baudrillard is mostly talking about this is like a function of modern mass media where, and this is also going back to the, the what starts with the visual, um, uh, the production of photographs and now then it, it sort of speeds up even more in um, television and movies and even like more kind of real things that seem, it makes the, the things that are represented seem almost even more real and present and, and viscerally uh, experienced. Um, and it's able to, with mass media, this the images are able to be repeated and disseminated more widely, just like uh, John was talking about. Now, 
Uh, where this goes for uh, Iwamura and uh, virtual Orientalism is that if you put these two together, she's noting how the kinds of representations of Asian religious traditions that we see in modern mass media were originally uh, like affected by these kind of old school Orientalist attitudes and they get repeated and reproduced so much that it leads to this kind of virtual Orientalism where it becomes baked into the way that we represent um, especially the Asian other. Uh, so it's not exactly centered on colonialism as such, like of the actual political enter and economic enterprise of colonialism, um, but more about kind of this caricature of Asian religions as a kind of like foil for Western ones. So like if you think that Western religion, uh, you know, like namely Christianity is kind of, uh, you know, inauthentic and uh, too rigid and everything. That's the complete opposite of the sort of mystical, spontaneous East, right? And this goes for many different Asian religious traditions. Um, and so what uh, Iwamura points out is that you see, so you take these visual representations of Asian religious traditions and practitioners. So they're selected and disseminated based on Western interests and assumptions about like, where the gaze of the Western other is going to land, that's sort of what gets reproduced and disseminated. Uh, and then this happens, you know, over time, many, 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 many times. And what you get is a stereotype that um, Iwamura calls the Oriental monk, or this is now taken to have, so, so like the sort of process leads to um, the viewer or the person consuming the media taking the oriental monk stereotype as somehow corresponding to reality like that there's this actually has that there's some link to the way that asian religious traditions are actually uh practiced in the real authentic context All right so as an example for this um Here's a picture of Swami Vivekananda uh, at the 1893 World Parliament of Religions. So this was uh, a representative of what we call, what we now call Hinduism, you know, the sort of broad um, constellation of in, in Indian traditions. I uh, was representing this in the 1893. This is essentially like a world's fair of religions. Um, and this is where a lot, there's a lot of in, significant things that happen at the 1893 World Parliament of Religions. Um, but one of them is that it's for a lot of Westerners or a lot of Americans, it happens in Chicago. It's their sort of first glimpse of the other and the representative, the representatives of these, uh, you know, exotic other religious groups are sort of, um, they're depicted in newspapers and disseminated widely. Uh, so around this time, you're also seeing uh, newspaper depictions of like visiting, uh, this was a newspaper depiction of a visiting uh, Japanese monk that uh, Iwamura uses in the book. And the idea is that a lot of these original depictions um, really focus on otherness and like, look at how crazy their clothes are and like that it's very, very different from Americans. But what you see over time is that it starts to verge into uh, what seems like an appreciation, but the appreciation is based on things that, um, Amer like Americans and Westerners in general sort of want to see, right? That they, and there's, uh, Iwamura points out how a lot of these things are sort of filling um, spiritual needs or kind of like cultural uh, impulses that Americans and Europeans have. And so what you get at the end is like this sort of stylized caricatures of people like Master Po and Kwang Chang Kane from Kung Fu, which was a TV series that ran in, in the US in the 1970s, where there is some represent, like the, the representation of, you know, some of the clothing and some of the, um, you know, ritual elements and the sort of visual elements are authentically, like there, there's some representation in reality, but it's packaged in a certain way that is really meant to speak to Western prerogatives and needs for, uh, you know, sort of spiritual insight and things like that. So uh, prime example, it's Mr. Miyagi uh, from The Karate Kid, uh, the beloved 1980s classic, The Karate Kid, uh, which is, you know, he's played by Noriyuki or Pat Morita, uh, who was nominated for a Best Supporting Actor uh, Award, Academy Award in, for his role as Mr. Miyagi. Now, um, I'm starting to run out of time. I've already run out of time here, um, so I don't want to take too much of this. But so I'm not gonna actually play the clip, but we will all who have who grew up and loved this movie will remember this famous like wax on wax off scene, where the setup is that uh, his American pupil his sort of brash, uh, you know, sort of rude American pupil 
um, is training with Mr. Miyagi for karate. And he has him doing these like seemingly nonsensical things. And uh, his student Daniel is like really um, complaining about it. And in his you know, very thick affected accent, Mr. Miyagi is like, no, this is not always as it seems. And he, so he tells him to like do the motions of like all of these chores that he was having him do. And then eventually starts throwing punches at him. And then, oh, lo and behold, the, you know, waxing the car on, waxing off was actually a block for a punch. And he realizes, oh, this is, there's so much that I have to learn for Mr. Miyagi. And as you can look the scene up uh, on YouTube and it's everywhere, like you can watch it if you want. But at the end of it, you can see like the actor who plays, um, Daniel uh, is like, he's sort of blown away by this in the end. And then as he sort of turns away to go home, there's this like sort of Zen flute that plays. So you cannot miss the, uh, <laughs> the, the sort of message that there was e secret Eastern wisdom that was imparted to Daniel on this day, right? Um, so the point about this is, the, or the reason why, like um, wh why this is significant or what happens with this is that the more that we see these these images, um, they're like John pointed out, they're and we uncritically consume them. The more likely it is that we will come to think that this actually represents the reality. And so this has been the case, especially with depictions of Asians and Asian Americans in Western um, Western media, and especially of Asian religious traditions. And this is why um, we have sort of certain preconceived notions about Buddhism and Hinduism of being a certain kind of religion that does not necessarily take into account the entire picture. Um, and so in class, I will normally have uh, a clip too that I play of um, from the Conan O'Brien show from a few years ago where he visited Korea and he visited a, um, a Korean monastery and he's talking to the monk and Stephen Yuan from The Walking Dead is his like interpreter. And he's talking to the monk and the guy is like, yeah, I know you from TV. And he's like, wait, what, you have TV? Uh, and the guy's like, yeah, he like pulls out a cell phone. He's like, yeah, like I have a cell phone. I watched it on YouTube. Like it's not. And Conan is like, his mind is blown because he's like, you're a Buddhist monk. You should not be doing any of these things. And the point is that be that's because his understanding of what being a Buddhist monk is, is sort of uh, informed by these repeated categories of the Oriental monk, right? So uh, what I want to end with this is a couple of uh, sort of notes for positive thing, you know, representations going forward. This is exactly why um, things like Crazy Rich Asians and the Netflix series Never Have I Ever were so significant and why people found them so significant was that here was an example where you had um, Asians and Asian Americans uh, sort of filling starring roles but not because they were a kung fu master or like a wizened sage, but just because they were just regular people, right? And like this was just a representation of their regular lives. And so this is kind of similar in the film version of uh, some of the things that we saw in Dr. Bodinger's um, presentation. But the the other plug, I've been reading this book myself and I wanted to sort of plug it at the end as, as a way to wrap up. Uh, if you want to explore any of the, these things more, I highly recommend uh, reading Charles Yu's uh, Interior Chinatown, which came out last year and won the National Book Award, where it's he's playing with like all of these things about sort of representations of, uh, especially Chinese Americans in, um, in film, movies and TV. And it's sort of woven into a narrative about an authentic Chinese immigrant uh, and sort of not non-immigrant um, sort of experience in the United States. So it gets a lot of these things way better than I have here. And I, so I, I highly recommend it. Um, okay, so I will stop here and I apologize for sharing my wrong screen, but uh, I know we're basically out of time, but if we want to, I can hang around uh, and answer questions if John wants to. Um, I'd, I'd like to for a few minutes. I have a four o'clock meeting and I have a, a sincere apology for stomping all over the time. I feel like I, I really went over there. And, oh, no, I and thought I'm I did. I'm sorry. That. that was my No, fault. no, you were, you were fine. You were fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah, sorry that I uh, did. I saw in the, in the Q and A's. So you should be able to use the Q and A to ask any questions uh, if you want. And we can take some of these as they come up if anybody has anything. It's interesting to think about crazy rich Asians as, as an example of just regular people because those right. people are so, <laughs> so insanely wealthy that it's like, yeah, okay. 
but yeah, I saw that a few months ago. I was like, oh my God, it's crazy. Yeah, and it was interesting too that that was, if you remember, that came out the same summer that Black Panther came out. And right. it was, so it was both of these things that was like, people were like, oh, wait, we can have a basically entirely, uh, you know, a cast made up of entirely of people of color that we don't normally see. And like, it's good. Right. We, we all want to see it. Like, this is really, and so I think that was a, it was an interesting cultural moment when that was yeah. happening. Yeah, it was. It was fun. Um, got 68 people in a room and nobody's saying anything. Feels like one of my classes, only larger. There we go. Ah. James Bond is a person of color. Yeah. Oh, why not? <laughs> Absolutely. I heard so that was a really that's a really good one. Um so it was did I never heard what did they actually cast because there was somebody that they were thinking of casting this and I don't remember whether it actually happened or not but I think it's an that's an awesome idea because um for the same reason that like it it's just sort of you have a person of color just inhabiting a role that is supposed to be I mean that is sort of quintessentially white I mean like he's James Bond as a character is in some sense like a projection of like British power like because he's you know he's well he's, British. he's a quintessential colonial power right yeah. yeah I mean like he's an agent of, he's a unstoppable agent of the British government uh, so to have a person of color in there is, I mean, in some, in some ways it might be problematic, like that there's a kind of con, you know, there's some tension there and I don't know how they would, they would um, address it, but yeah, it's a really, it would be an inner, very interesting move. I think they're it. already finishing it. I think it's a woman and then, and she's a person of color. And I think I've seen um, uh, advances, uh, rush, uh, advertisements for it already. Anybody in the room can correct me. I also have to um, offer my apologies because I have to run to a four o'clock meeting. Um, do representations have material power or are they all about feelings? No, they certainly have material power, right? I mean, this is kind of, you know, to, to respond to this really quickly, this is sort of a distinction I make of looking at photographs as being both evidential, right? They've got some kind of evidence of what they've seen in front of the lens, but also as being evocative, right? That what they do is that they generate a certain kind of, of affect or they speak to a certain kind of feeling. So, you know, your picture of your Uncle Fred could be, okay, that's what Uncle Fred looked like and he had a mustache like that and he was in the army, but your picture of Uncle Fred also engenders all these feelings connected to the Fredness of Uncle Fred or the uncleness of Uncle Fred fishing trips or you know, terrible political discussions at the Thanksgiving table or, or whatever. And that, that photographs kind of navigate this sort of porous boundary between material evidence and emotional significance. Yeah. I think also uh, Dr. Mall mentioned, made this comment about uh, media, social media and representations there. And that is, so I think if, if anything, if you think about like uh, someone like Baudrillard is really thinking about um, you know, mass media where like the worst case scenario is we all went to the theater and like saw the same film or whatever. And now with social media, it's the algorithms are making it so that we're seeing literally the same image that is extremely filtered and doctored, right? Like to the point where there's, there's an even smaller represent, uh, connection to the actual reality. And it's so curated and so, um, yeah, sort of doctored. And then it's repeated over, like ad infinitum. There's no way that that's going to not end up being, you know, having a sort of similar effect. All right. Yeah. There are more questions than I have time to answer, but they're really, really good, and I'm kind of sad. Yeah, um, they are. Um, yeah, you know this this idea that that anthropology in particular, but both of our our, our disciplines in some sense participate in or at least rest on a history of colonial power structures, absolutely. How do we deal with that? By hopefully teaching people how to think critically about what those things are doing. Um, I mean, at least that's what I'm trying to do when I'm looking at, you know, histories or questions of photographic representation of Native people, Native Americans, um, Black Americans, people of color, is to look at, to recognize how they use, uh, you know, their establishment of particular powerful discourse and then how we can also chip away at that discourse, reposition them, unsettle them, reimagine them in, in different directions. 
Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, sort of building on some of the themes from uh, the rest of the MLK teach-in, I think one of the things that we always end up with in my class is we're like, well, so should, can we not enjoy Karate Kid anymore? Like, <laughs> but, and I, but I think that there's a lot of these, so like, can we not, how do, how do we get around these things? And I think one of the things that came up in another session was, we'll try to consume, try to consume media that is produced by people of color. So like that, you know, there's still, interestingly, there's still stuff that you can do to analyze this. And there's ways that, you know, representations of power and hierarchy and everything are still still reiterated and communicated through those media. But you're at least going to get a broader spectrum of voices and representation um, in having a sort of more varied media diet, I guess. I would agree with that. I'm so sorry. I do have to run. Um, okay. But thank you all very much. Thank you for, for showing up. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for your questions. Yeah. I'm sorry if I can't engage all of them. Uh, John, if anybody has questions, can they email you? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank so you. me too, since we're out of time, me too. If you anybody wants to just send us uh, emails to, to follow up with anything, I think we'd love to chat about it. So thanks. Right. Thanks a lot, thank everybody. You.